participation in trying to save Pine Mountain, the whole mountain. I also wear a couple of hats. I've also served, I'm very honored to serve on the board here at the Pine Mountain Settlement School. I've been on the board for like 10 or 12 years, but I've been associated with the school for 25 years maybe. Uh, goes back so far, I don't remember exactly. And um, I also wanted to, while we're waiting, I wanted to thank the settlement school, Jeff and Sky, for, for hosting this and going through so much work to put this together for you all. And I also want to thank the uh, Society for Economic Botany for choosing to come here to this relatively remote corner of the United States. Um, so thank you all very much. And before, I was going to give a three-hour talk, um, but I was told I could not do that. So what we're going to do first, we just created a video about the Pine Mountain Wildland Corridor and the work we're doing on the mountain. So, so to stop me from talking for three hours, we're going to show the video first, and, um, and then I'll, I'll say some words also. It's only seven minutes. It, yeah, the, the video is only seven minutes, so I still have two hours and <laughs> so, um, what do I have to do to start it, Greg? Okay. You don't want me touching computers. This is our silent movie. <laughs> Places of beauty and wonder where we can reflect, recharge, discover, and explore. <laughs> they are home to the many species we share this vast planet with. They are the fabric of the web of life that sustains us. They provide us with clean water to drink and air to breathe. They are the places we cherish, a defining part of our heritage. These wild places represent a wealth of natural capital and are vital to both economic and human health. The resiliency of local, regional, and global communities depend on functioning natural systems that can withstand threats through adaptation and change. This is of particular importance in the face of shifting climate. Protecting and sustainably managing our wildlands is essential to fostering this resiliency. Some of the wildest stretches of central Appalachia can be found in Kentucky along Pine Mountain a 125-mile forested ridgeline running from Tennessee through eastern Kentucky to Virginia that is crossed only by nine roads and three rivers. Free of mineable coal, this forested mountain is a critical refuge and migratory route that runs through a region familiar with extensive resource extraction. There are nearly 100 species of rare plants and animals known to live on the mountain. Some found nowhere else on the entire planet. Part of a major wildlife corridor through eastern North America, the mountain is the pathway black bears have been using to return to Kentucky. It provides important summer nesting grounds and a migratory route for birds as they return from wintering in Central and South America. 
and it offers key habitat to monarch butterflies during their annual epic journey. Pine Mountain is home to the mixed mesophytic forest, one of the most diverse temperate forests found on the planet. Towering ancient hemlock trees and the largest remaining tracts of old growth forest are scattered along the mountain. The streams that flow off the mountain protect unique aquatic species and are part of the headwaters of the Kentucky, Cumberland, and Big Sandy rivers. These rivers flow into the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, forming the fourth largest river system in the world. Water from these streams is an important drinking water source for many communities and is an essential part of Kentucky's bourbon and craft beer industries. Pine Mountain is a matrix of public lands that offer hiking, birding, and more. As the outdoor recreation industry continues to grow, it has become an essential part of the unfolding transitional economy in Appalachia. Pine Mountain represents a key link in the Great Eastern Trail, a 1,800-mile hiking trail planned from New York to Alabama. Sadly, the expansive biological treasure that is Pine Mountain is under continual threat. Limestone quarries continue to expand along the north face of the mountain. Large logging operations, along with oil and gas development, are clearing and fragmenting the forest, and invasive species continue to spread all along the mountain. At the same time, a generational shift is underway that threatens to further fragment the ownership of the mountain, making preservation efforts much more complex. In the mid-1990s, the largest tract of old-growth forest remaining in the state was discovered on Pine Mountain. A group of friends stepped forward to protect this biological treasure and formed the Kentucky Natural Lands Trust. The trust protected the land and established Lantern Forest, now an internationally recognized old growth forest preserve near Harlan. Kentucky Natural Lands Trust's focus has since broadened to encompass all 125 miles of Pine Mountain, representing the largest conservation effort in Kentucky's history. By working with private landowners and partnering with national, regional, and local conservation organizations, the Trust has protected, connected, and restored thousands of acres of land. Kentucky Natural Lands Trust's conservation goals depend on individual supporters and a diverse network of partners. In this interlinked web of life on Earth, Local actions have global significance. Protecting Pine Mountain is an opportunity for positive change locally, regionally, and globally. We must intensify efforts to protect our land, our air, and our water. Having lost so much already, it is essential for our future that we protect and steward what remains. Visit knlt.org to learn how to get involved. To uh, help us in our efforts um, to protect the mountain and get the word out. Kentucky Natural Lands Trust now, I'm, I'm going to repeat actually several things that the mountain that the movie said in my talk. But we established the uh, Kentucky Natural Lands Trust over 20 years ago. We were first the Blanton Forest Trust, and that was to protect Blanton Forest. Uh, 
I, I worked as an inventory biologist here in Kentucky for the last almost 30 years, and I had what I considered to be the very best job in the world. Um, they paid me to run around the woods for 30 years and look for cool plants and animals. I mean, it could not have been better for me personally. Um, and they said, they gave me the whole state of Kentucky, and they said, go for it and inventory, look for rare and endangered species and unique natural areas. So I took them literally, and I rarely was in the office. I was in the field most of the time for the last 30 years. And as long as you don't mind ticks and chiggers and snakes and things like that, which I like all of them, so it's okay. Um, so let me see, how do I advance this? Uh, but I, I have to say something first about the settlement school. This is one of my most favorite places on the planet Earth right here. And of course, I haven't seen all of the Earth yet, but I'm working really hard to see as much of this planet as I can. And um, even when I'm traveling in far remote parts of the world, coming back here is like coming home all the time. And uh, the settlement school is a very unique, special place. Um, we always talk about it having the spirit of Pine Mountain, and that's the way this place feels. <coughs> and the mountain looms up behind it there. It's always beautiful any season. And we would hope you guys would come back here as often as you can. Um, we already had a Wendell Berry quote, as you can tell. Wendell Berry, I don't know how many of you know Wendell. How many of you have heard of Wendell Berry? That's great. That's really great to see. Wendell's a, a friend of the Kentucky Natural Lands Trust. He's been a big supporter of ours. Um, in fact, a book that we, we produced a few years ago, Kentucky's Natural Heritage, um, Greg Abernathy and I and a couple other people co-authored this. Uh, we got Wendell Berry to write the foreword, which I was, I'm really thrilled. It, it made a big difference, I think, in, in getting attention for the book. <coughs> so I wanted to mention that. And um, so you've, you've got the basic background of what KNLT does. When we first formed to protect Blanton Forest, uh, we were told, oh, you'll never be able to do it. Kentucky doesn't have a big conservation community. And government here is not, uh, conservation is not the highest priority for the government here in Kentucky either. Uh, so we said, we, we got to do this. And so we successfully raised $3 million to purchase this tract of land. We were flush with success. We were happy. And we were going to disband. We, we met our goal, protect the old growth forest. But then some folks, some of our um, supporters and benefactors and folks within the organization, we said, you know, the whole mountain is really, really important and significant. We already know that. Why don't we try to protect the whole mountain? It's in an area of great resource removal, as you know, but here's this green swath of forest cutting right through the coal fields with minimal impacts compared to the surrounding landscape. So we said, okay, let's protect the whole mountain. We were very naive 20 some years ago. I don't know if I would probably start that again right now, but we've been successful. We've been raising lots of money for 20 years. I'm no longer a field biologist. I'm a fundraiser. That's what happens when we do these kind of things. And, um, but first we'll start a little bit with just the global perspective. Most of you have probably already seen this report that came out, but I thought it was fascinating. <coughs> Hugh Gardens, State of the World's Plants. It's the first time it's really compiled this kind of information. And it's fascinating. But the thing that's not fascinating to me, uh, down here, whoops, go back over here. One in five plants are at risk of extinction. 20% of our plants. And 400,000 plants almost, 31,000 have a documented use. There's a lot of plants we haven't studied yet. And, um, and we're losing them fast. And I like the 5,000 are eaten. I always like that. Um, and I'm not going to try and give a doom and gloom talk, but it's hard to talk about environmental protection and the state of the environment without talking a little bit doom and gloom. So one third of all North American birds, and you know, we're in the temperate forest zone here. And the temperate forest is a major forest in the northern hemisphere that covers a vast area. I'm doing what you did, Ralph, hitting the wrong buttons. There we go. The northern hemisphere still has a vast areas of uh, temperate forest a little bit smaller areas in the southern hemisphere. Um, and in North America, we're well within the uh, temperate forest zone. And uh, physiographically, 
as Ralph already went over, we're in the Appalachian Highlands section right down here. And uh, this is a map that um, Greg and I produced when we were working at the Nature Preserves Commission. The natural regions pretty much reflects the physiographic regions. We're down here in this unique area called the Cumberland Mountains right here. And that's the area I'll focus on. But Kentucky, even though we're a small state, we've got great diversity in the state because of our east-west run here. And from the coastal plain out here, we have all the cypress swamps. It's just like being in Louisiana. And the Highland Rim, which is a vast karst area filled with caves and sinkholes. And that was millions of acres of prairie grassland at the time of settlement. Um, part of that reflects the geology of Kentucky, which is very interesting. I'm not a geologist, but geology is very cool, I think. And if you're a botanist, of course, geology is very important to us. So, just gives a cross section, and what's cool is you can see the natural regions pretty much reflect the underlying bedrock geology and the shapes and everything. And of course, we're right down here at Pine Mountain, this little line right there, running through there. Um, what's also interesting is precipitation map. Kentucky again is a small state, but there's a great difference in precipitation between northern Kentucky right here, it's under 40 inches of rainfall. But right here where we are, look at these blobs. We often get more than 60 inches of rain a year here, and it does not count fog precipitation. Fog is common out here almost daily. On, um, it creates a lot of water that's not registered as precip. So it's kind of like a temperate rainforest here. And if you walked around in the forest here, you'll see it's almost like the tropics in some ways. Um, this is a graphic from our book here. I don't know if you can read, but this is a synopsis of the biological diversity knowledge in Kentucky right now. And you can see that uh, insects rule the world, of course, like everywhere. And seed plants, vascular plants, there's a little over 2,000 known vascular plants native to Kentucky. There's about 600 non-native plants. So the actual floor of Kentucky is about 2,600. But this is dealing right here with just native species. Um, what's very interesting is the mollusks and the fishes. We have very, very high diversity of freshwater mollusks and fishes in Kentucky. And 370 bird species is also a very high count for an interior kind of state like this. Um, so what was, Cumberland, what, was, what was Kentucky like when the first European settlers came through Cumberland Gap? Cumberland Gap is a place not too far down in the mountains here in the Cumberland Mountains. It was the main funnel for the early settlers. If it wasn't for these gaps, uh, settlement would have, would have uh, been very different in Kentucky. So Greg and I and some others put together this pre-settlement land cover map, which I think is very, very cool. So when settlers first came, probably 90%, 85, 90% of Kentucky was forested, basically. In this area here in the brown, this was the prairie regions of Kentucky, and there was some prairie out here. The yellow is forest, but it's all wetland forest for the most part, some marsh, swamps. And in the central bluegrass, we had savannas, these really interesting large savannas that were mostly destroyed 200 years ago, because that was the first part of Kentucky that was settled. Now if you go to Lexington, you'll see these really pretty horse farms. To me, they're very sterile, because they're just one species of grass. But they still have some of these huge old burrows, the chinkapin oak trees that are centuries old, scattered in the pasture. And if you really have a good imagination, you can kind of picture what it used to look like. The fact is, this area was called the land of cane and clover originally. There was so much um, native cane around an area here, but you rarely see that anymore in the uplands. So what's happened since then? Even though Kentucky doesn't have a high population, we're still changing things rapidly. One square mile per week is being converted in Kentucky. 365 days a year, or however weeks per year. No break for Christmas or New Year's, all the time. And um, we've, we're losing forest land still to this day. We've lost vast tracts of forest. And so this is Kentucky today. And one thing I like to do um, Kentucky then, Kentucky now. It kind of gives you an idea of why we feel such an urgency to protect what remains of our wildlands in Kentucky. 
you know, you walk around out here in Eastern Kentucky, you think, oh, lots of forests, species seem like they're doing well, plants and animals, but it's not the case. When you take a bigger outside perspective and look at the whole state, populations, almost all native plants and animals are going down, down, down. So it's very imperative that we protect as much of the remaining wildlands to protect these, these things. So, so, there. So as a result of finding this stuff out, one of the things we did when I worked at the Nature Preserves Commission, again, this is a Greg and Mark project mostly, um, we decided to do an analysis. Everyone says, oh, Kentucky's got a lot of forests, 50% forest is still no problem there. I said, there's a problem. So let's find out, you know, forests, you guys are all biologists, forests evolve to be really, really big. Forest ecosystems work on a large scale. When you start chopping forests up into little pieces, little pieces, they don't function as they do as a large entity. So we wanted to find out where's the remaining large tracts of forest. So this map is one of the results of that, and um, this is a, over a thousand acres, or less than a thousand acres, greater than a thousand acres. You can see the majority of the large tracts of forest are here in eastern Kentucky, except for some exceptions. This is Mammoth Cave National Park which is an amazing place, the world's largest cave still to this day, UNESCO World Heritage Site. Up here is a cool private forest called Bernheim Forest. And military bases turn out to be very important for protection of biodiversity, despite that not being their main purpose. And um, this is Fort Knox right here. And um, it has large, large areas of natural land. Well, it's funny, we can't get in there to inventory it because it's filled with unexploded ordnance. So it's very hard to get in there inventory work. But um, so one of the analysis, this shows large forest blocks from 900 acres up to the large size. And you can see in western Kentucky, most of Kentucky, the forest blocks are small, on a small side. But when you look at, um, okay, we have 2,000 large forest blocks, make up only 29% of the state. So all of a sudden, 50% forested is not so accurate. But the really frightening thing to me is the average woodlot size in Kentucky is 30 acres. Um, anyone that knows much about forest ecology knows that 30 acres is not a forest. Just the edge effect alone of the forest, you know, the wind and the drying, the, the edge creates, basically penetrates through the whole forest, depending on the shape. And I kind of call it like Hotel California. Plants and animals go in, but they never come out. They don't check out of there. It's a sink. For, for these things. And so if you look at large tracts of forest, and even 5,000 acres is not that large for a block of forest. Look what happens, how they disappear. From here, then the 5,000 acre tracts. Almost everything's out here in eastern Kentucky, which is one of the reasons we focus most of our efforts out in this part of the state. Um, and what's the result of all this habitat destruction and change, and that's extinction, extirpation, and species on the brink. Here in Kentucky, we have over 700 species of plants and animals that we monitor as rare or threatened or special concern. We've already lost quite a few species that we know of, 54 to begin with, six plants, four mammals, 22 mussels, nine fishes, 11 birds. And, um, but here on the mountain, we have almost 100 of these rare species that we're protecting right now, and probably many more. You know, Ralph, and Ben Bagley, they did the flora here of Pine Mountain Settlement School. And Lucy Braun, she really didn't do flora, she was doing ecological studies. There's been very, very few floras on the mountain here. We need someone, Ralph, to do a flora of the entire mountain. Would you like to do that, please, sir? <laughs> I know you're going to give me a long debbie. <laughs> <laughs> Just take 100 years, maybe, or something. Um, you know, we have caves on the mountain, which I'll talk about, Indiana bats. It's an important migratory corridor for, from butterflies to birds. Um, it's kind of like um, some of the mountains in the Appalachians. Certain times of the year, you can be up on the top of the mountain and just see hawks going all day long, following the mountain ridge in their migration period. And we have cool things like hellbender. We saw that in the video. An aquatic, a giant aquatic salamander. I think it's the largest salamander in North America. Um, and so threats. Threats, threats, threats everywhere. We already went through those on the thing. 
One I have to mention here because it's directly affecting Pine Mountain, and that's the hemlock woolly adelgid, an Asian insect that got here somehow, you know, who knows how all these things get here on purpose or not, but it's killing our hemlock trees. And hemlocks are an essential keystone species in the hemlock-dominated communities. They create a thick duff, um, they create dense shade, and the species that evolved with the hemlock trees are now getting too much sunlight because the hemlocks are dying. And uh, we're treating hemlocks. There's a chemical that you can use to treat, but it's a stopgap measure. And we can't treat all the hemlocks. We estimated there's 70 million hemlocks in Kentucky. We can't treat them all. And the treatment only lasts for a few years, then you have to retreat. So things are changing. Just like losing the American chestnut, you know, ash trees are going now from the emerald ash borer. There's a lot of impacts that even when we save land, things are still changing on it. Now, for those things, kudzu, I don't know if you're all driving around here, you can see massive amounts of kudzu eating away fields and forests. We call it a kudzu topiary. I'm going to do a book someday because sometimes the kudzu makes these really amazing shapes. I see dinosaurs and mammoths and things, and it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, so this is self-explanatory. <laughs> it's an unfortunate slide. You know, we'll be fighting invasive exotic species forever. It's something we've, we've got to learn to live with. We try to control the most aggressive ones, but they're a part of our flora and fauna now. And there's not much we can do about it. You know, I've got nothing against cutting trees. Um, I've cut down trees and I like to use wood. I like to work with wood. But there's a right way and a wrong way to cut forests. And massive amounts of clear cutting are not the right way. It might be the right way monetarily to take in as much money as you can, but it destroys the forest ecosystem. If, if this were ever to come back, it'll take centuries and centuries and centuries, if not thousands of years. And you'll never get back the community that existed there before. Um, Ralph went over mining. So I won't do it, we're in the middle of the, one of the most massive areas of resource removal. And, uh, but on Pine Mountain, we're very lucky. And one of the reasons we chose Pine Mountain, when one of the reasons Pine Mountain is so intact is because there's no commercially mineable coal on the mountain. That has to do with the geologic upthrust, which I'll explain all the coal eroded off a long time ago. So we're very lucky that way. We don't have to, we don't have to butt heads with the big coal companies because we would lose. Um, they're a lot bigger than us. So, but there is limestone uh, here on the north side of the mountain right here. And it's a very pure limestone. It adds great diversity to the mountain biologically because there's, you know, it's not acidic soil all of a sudden. You get calcium for snails. We have an amazing land snail fauna here. But um, they're eating away. And then, of course, there's climate change, which everyone's aware of. I won't go into it except Greg. Did you make this graphic, Greg? No. <laughs> you got it somewhere? It's a very cool graphic. It's very simple, but um, growing zones, climate change, is moving 3.8 feet per year on average right now. And you go, at eh, three feet, no big deal. If you're a bear, it's, it's easy. Like, it's 3.8 feet a day, a quarter mile a year. A quarter mile, thank you, I stand corrected. Thank you. 3.8 feet per day. Okay, that's a big difference, isn't it? But if you're a little critter, you know, it's, you can't make it. So one of the things that's cool about Pine Mountain is it basically runs north-south. And so it gives plants and animals an opportunity to migrate. And as you all know, everything migrates at a different rate of speed. And so during this migration period, things are really mixing up. It's going to be very confusing for quite a long period of time because the pollinators might not move as fast as the plants or vice versa. And so it makes for some serious changes right here. So what are we doing about that? On, on the continent-wide, there's uh, organizations, the Wildlands Network and many other nonprofit groups are working on plans to create wildways across North America. And what we're doing here, this is our version for Kentucky. Um, you all probably heard of um, E.O. Wilson's Half Earth book that's out now. Very interesting book to read if you haven't done so. Um, I find it fascinating. But we've been talking about this for a long time, and we need to protect more and more of the earth. And I'm really glad EO came out with this, this thing. But, so we think we're being very generous. This is not half of Kentucky, so EO may not be happy with us. But this is our proposed draft conceptual map, and of course, 
we're working on our little strip right down here in the mountains right now. Um, and speaking of migratory routes and corridors, Kentucky has a direct connection with Central and South America through the migration of birds that, that, that summer here and then winter in Central and South America. And um, so now we're going to get into the cool stuff, the positive stuff. I'm done with the doom and gloom, and we're going to talk about this amazing mountain. Now, High Mountain Wildlands Corridor, we said 125 miles long, this is an old slide, five miles. It's not a very tall mountain, it's very easy to walk up in a day and down, but it's a big mountain, it's long, it's a ridge 125 miles long, over 180,000 acres, um, and basically almost entirely forested, it's only crossed by nine roads, and those nine roads are the roads that break up each of the large forest blocks that make up this mountain, otherwise it's just a series of huge forest blocks still. Um, already mentioned the rare species, 40 known caves, and it's it's well documented that it's used as a migratory corridor by many species. Um, so our goals for Pine Mountain, you know, we started doing this 22 years ago, and we've been rocking and rolling ever since, buying land. And um, so we want to protect the areas of greatest ecological significance, create the wildlife corridor. Um, a lot of the land we buy, we try to roll over to other conservation um, agencies so we can get that money back and then reuse it. But some of the land we end up keeping. And we want to um, do demonstration sustainable forestry practices because that's been, other than mining, the number one industry out here is logging. And logging can be done in a much better way than it currently is. And we like to work with private landowners and try and encourage uh, forest and land management and support locally owned and environmentally compatible economic enterprises. You saw the location of uh, the corridor here. Um, I don't know how well you can see this. This is a mishmash of different colors. These are all properties now in the different colors that have some level of protection. And the Pine Mountain Settlement School is right, right here. So we're, Pine Mountain Settlement School is like right in the middle of Pine Mountain, which I think is really cool. And um, the mountain just, as you can see, just runs and runs and runs. So when I did the inventory here in 19, early 1990s, I was very excited because I really like the mountains. It's known for its diversity and it's got wilderness areas. I've been inventorying much of the rest of Kentucky. So I was, my plan, I said, oh, I'm going to walk the entire mountain up and down every hollow. Um, well, I never covered the entire mountain. It's too big. But I covered a lot of the mountain doing that. Um, and as a side benefit of this, there's a, there's a Pine Mountain State Trail, which is part of the Great Eastern Trail, which is mentioned in the video. And so much of the land we purchase here is important for the trail. And that's one of these, uh, part of the transitional economy for, to, to create outdoor recreation opportunities here in the mountains. And, you know, everyone's probably familiar with the AT, the Appalachian Trail. You know, there's been many economic studies on how much it's um, assisted and helped the local communities. And our hope is that when this is completed, it will have the same kind of effect on the local uh, economy here. We're also part of the um, watershed, headwaters of three major watersheds here in North America, the Ohio, Tennessee, and Lower Mississippi. And what's kind of cool, we're tied into the fourth largest watershed on the whole planet, Earth, which is the Mississippi-Ohio River system. And uh, can't talk about Pine Mountain without talking about my hero, um, and that's, everyone called her Dr. Lucy when she was alive, E. Lucy Brown, Brown. and uh, she published probably 190 articles and several books, but for me, the most important ones working out here were these. These were my Bibles when I, when I started doing the inventory out here. And she first drew our attention to Pine Mountain um, as being significant at the Nature Preserves Commission when we formed in the 70s. So she documented Bad Branch. So we immediately, in fact, Hugh Archer, wherever he is, Hugh is our executive director at the Kentucky National Lands Trust. Hugh was the executive director of the Nature Conservancy also many years ago. And he purchased um, the first large tracks here on Pine Mountain at Bad Branch. And for those of you that are staying for the Footsteps Lucy Braun program, I know some of you are. You're going to visit Bad Branch and see some of these amazing areas. In fact, 
I would really encourage all of you, if you have the weekend free after the meeting, stay for the weekend and see some of the amazing diversity and beauty of Pine Mountain. It's an amazing, it's a fantastic weekend program. Um, so, so Lucy and I go way back, and I'm not going to say a lot about Lucy. I don't want to steal the thunder from somebody who's going to give a whole presentation on Lucy later. Uh, but in her book on the vegetation of Pine Mountain, she's got all kinds of cool old black and white photos. She studied the mountain out here when most of the forest was still virgin. There were still American chestnut trees. They were dying, as she talks about. But she was able to sample the, the virgin forest here and gave us so much baseline data that we could never have anymore. So we're really, really grateful to her. Um, you can see her standing right here, and that's a big, uh, I can't see what kind of tree that is. A big buckeye right there. Thanks. Um, had the same map, bronze forest region. Of course, we're right here in the mixed mesophytic, right in the heart of the mixed mesophytic forest region. And as uh, now, okay, I'll get to the geology. This is fun stuff. Right now, we're all sitting in a dangerous place. We're sitting on a fault line. Luckily, it's not an active fault line. Um, but the fault line literally runs right through the school property right here. And that would be this fault line right here. And so, when the Appalachian Mountains were first formed, the Appalachian Mountains have gone through actually several uplifts and, and erosional periods. Boom, 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 up and down, up and down over millions and millions of years. The last big upthrust of the Appalachian orogeny was about 275 million years ago. And that's when this big thrust fault block was, was created and it was, it was raised up thousands of feet and it pushed up over the existing Cumberland Plateau area. And I wish I knew that because the other side of this is a mirror image. It's Cumberland Mountain, um, just to the east of here. It looks just like this, except comes up on this side. And what's really cool is this whole rectangular thrust fault block, which is about 100 miles long, maybe 30 miles wide. The whole thing was shoved north like six to eight miles. It must have been incredible if you were standing there. Um, I don't think you'd be standing too long. And what's, what's most interesting all these layers of sandstones and shales and one layer of limestone here were deep, deep under the earth there. Was, um, and were brought, brought to the surface. So that's the thing. And then one of the things most beneficial to me was Lucy Braun's cross-section, or hand drawn cross-section of Pine Mountain. Very cool. There she, she describes each one of these sections the vegetation and the flora, and it was extremely useful to me. Um, if you've never read The Vegetation of Pine Mountain, it's really good reading. It'll keep you awake all night. Um, it does for me anyway. So Lucy was very, very impressed with Pine Mountain. She studied many forests all around the eastern U.S., actually in the western U.S. too. But she said this mountain here had more different communities, and more contrast between the communities than anything else in the Cumberland Mountains. So another reason we're focusing on the mountains because of, of her, her knowledge. And this is the home of the mixed mesophytic forest, which is the richest temperate deciduous forest, one of the richest temperate deciduous forests on the planet Earth. Sometimes they say, yes, I'm the richest. Um, there's other temperate deciduous forests, a very rich one in China and in the in, uh, Himalayan mountains. Um, but this place, compared to other temperate deciduous forests, is exceedingly rich. There's over, she lists over 42 species in the canopy. Um, Ralph, you had said like 30, and I think is what you said, and that's what I always use too, but in reading her paper, she said 42 species. Um, and things like our magnolias and so many species. So last night at 2 a.m., I decided I'll never have all these memorized, so I decided just quickly to write down some of the top species, just so you can see the species that dominate in the forests here. Any one track of forest may not have all of these species in one spot, but overall, on the mixed mesophytic forest here, we'll have this great diversity, um, and it's, it's just magnificent. Ralph mentioned American chestnut, how important it was, making up to almost 50% of the canopy in some of the forest communities. 
And of course, we've lost the American chestnut as an active participant. But the very cool thing is, when I first, first started doing field work 30 some years ago, you can find chestnut sprouts all over the mountains. The roots are not killed, and so they keep re-sprouting. And as soon as they get a certain size, the canker, the fungus attacks them, they die back down to the ground. So uh, maybe 15 years ago, I was walking through the forest, and you know, as a botanist, I'm looking down a lot, right? Always looking, looking at plants. And that's how you run into bears and other things, though, too. But all of a sudden, I look, and there's this really strange husk on the ground. It took me a minute to realize it was American chestnut. It's not something I'm used to seeing. Um, and I looked up and there was American chestnut trees mature, reached sexual maturity, flowered and reproduced and produced fruit. I, I did a dance in the forest. It was so <laughs> exciting. And then since then, I've been finding more and more and more American chestnuts that are now reaching sexual maturity and reproducing. So what's going on? Um, either the trees are developing resistance, the blight is becoming less virulent, or a combination of both is what we think. But, you know, you give nature half a chance and she will heal herself. And so I'm really thrilled that probably not in our lifetime, but next lifetime, American chestnuts are going to come back and be a part of the, the canopy again and part of the forest community. And it was one of the most important trees for both humans and wildlife. You know, chestnuts roasting on an open fire, I won't sing that one, but there's lots of songs about American chestnuts. And so the largest conservation effort in Kentucky's history, when we first started, we were told, you'll never be able to do it, it's too big, this is Kentucky. Luckily, we ignored them, and here, 20, almost 25 years later, we're rocking and rolling and buying thousands and thousands of acres every year on the mountain, adding in these, uh, these light yellow areas or gold areas are the areas that still have private property. But actually, see this big block right here? I'll show you, we just purchased over 2,000 acres here. And so we're filling in all these gaps on the corridor. And I actually can see that we're, we're gonna actually do this probably in my lifetime, which is really amazing. Um, Kentucky's famous for its caves and karst. Um, we have one of the best developed karst topographies on the planet Earth in this region called the Penny Royal. Um, there's very little surface drainage, which is why probably prairies occurred there, because a fire could just roll for miles and miles and miles without any breaks. But the reason I put this up is uh, zoom in and you look at Pine Mountain right here. Because of this limestone layer that we have here that we up thrust because of the uh, geology, we have many, many, many caves these are not like mammoth cave caves. These are caves that I do not like to go in. Um, there's no vascular plants in these caves, so I tend to stay out. I often, I'm often the guard at the entrance to the cave. You always have someone guarding the entrance to the cave. I always volunteer for that. But these caves are very cool, and they add to the diversity. They harbor many unique species. Um, so we know 42 caves on the mountain, many, many more to be found. There are little cracks in the rock that are hard to find and we have endemic cave beetles, undescribed invertebrates, things that only biologists can get excited about. Usually when I show this, this is Rogers Cave Beetle. This is only known from right here on Pine Mountain Settlement School, nowhere else on the whole planet Earth. And so I know you guys are thrilled over it, but when I'm talking to the general public, mm, it doesn't go over so well. <laughs> so Pine Mountain runs and runs and runs down the, down the whole length of these counties. If you go to Harlan, it towers over the city there. And um, like I said, I wanted to go up and down every one of these. Out here, these, these ravines or valleys are called hollows and are hollows. But then the common vernacular is a holler. And that's what I've adopted for a long time. So I go up and down these hollers. Used to be able to go up and down two or three of them in a day. I cannot do that anymore. <laughs> um, I don't have that kind of stamina. There's all kinds of unique features on the mountain. Large, large rock outcrops. I get very excited about big rock outcrops. Um, first, they're just really cool, but they often mean different species, you know, that are associated with these things. So that's where we find some of our rare things. This is a screenshot I just took from Google Earth. Um, one of the newest tracts of land we um, are in the process of purchasing has this really large series of rock outcrops. And uh, I got so excited, 
the survey's not even done yet, but I had to come visit it. And so Hugh and I went out there on a day, it was like this weekend, it poured and poured and poured rain. And we got out there and we walked up this trail, but the trail was like class six rapids coming down the mountain. It was an amazing hike up this mountain. The mountain's steep as it is, or we're sloshing things like standing waves that are just coming down the mountain. It was amazing. By the time we made it, this is, as you can see, most of the way up the mountain, we made it to this corner right over here. We said, oh, we're here, we're here. So we, we cut through the woods and got to this rock out right here. And lichen and moss are very, very slippery when they're wet. And so we mostly slid on our butts, dumping down these rocks. So we never made it out to these really big rocks yet. That's still, they've been waiting there millions of years. They'll wait another little longer for us to come explore the place. Um, all seasons, the mountain here is just amazing. The winter is one of the most beautiful times. The fog settles on the mountain. It goes below freezing, and you get this thing called a hoar frost. And if you walk through the forest without sunglasses and the sun comes out, you'll be blinded, instantly blinded. It's so stunningly beautiful. Um, Bad Branch is the first um, natural area that we started working on 30 years ago. Hugh did this thing. Um, I won't get into all the tracks, but these are the various tracks of land that we're working on protecting all together. It makes many, many, many thousands of acres right there. Um, it's a deep gorge. This is the, the place that um, Dr. Lucy did most of her studies on in Pine Mountain, one of her main places with lots and lots of data here. And she studied this before it was law. This, this is not only a forest here. Um, it was logged heavily in the 1940s, and she talks about being in the forest while they were logging it and documenting it. And she listed so many rare species of plants that occur here because there's nice microclimate, microhabitats here because of the deep gorge. And so the 1970s come, and we formed the Nature Preserves Commission, and our job was to protect Kentucky and do inventory. So of course, Lucy was one of our main guides. We went to Bad Branch. And this is what's cool about nature again. And you think, ah oh, man, it was log, everything's gonna be gone. No, almost all the rare species are still there. They're in smaller numbers, but they're still there. And now they're recovering now that the area is protected. So it's very cool. This beautiful waterfall there. It's only a one mile hike to go up to the waterfall. I think you guys are going there for the Footsteps of Lucy Braun this weekend. Um, it's a great place in the hot weather just to stand in the winter. It freezes. It's very cool looking. Um, the black side dace is a federally endangered fish that occurs there. This fish requires really, really clean water. Luckily, the water coming off the mountain itself is as clean as water can be. It's 100% forested watershed. Most of a lot of the folks drink the water out of the streams here. I used to do that until I got really sick once, and now I don't drink out of the streams anymore. Uh, things like Fraser Sedge, some of those Fraser Eye. Uh, the top of the mountain, there's these big rock outcrops that we hike up to and bring groups. Beautiful place, all kinds of cool plants. Um, it's called High Rock, Mars Rock up there, don't you names. And Mountain Laurel flowering right now. This is the season for Mountain Laurel. It grows out of the rocks and crevices up on the very top of the mountain. And you know, this is a, the whole plant is highly poisonous. Very cool looking, but you don't want to eat this plant. And you don't want to eat honey made from this plant either. Um, one of my favorite trillions we have. Uh, Ralph showed you several trillions. One of my favorite trillions, though, is the painted trillion. Absolutely gorgeous. It's a state endangered species, but so showy. Um, and then cool little mint called Mehania cordata, Nehan's mint. Um, very rare in Kentucky. It's an uh, Appalachian species. Uh, Sangosorba canadensis, the name tells you something. It's more of a northern species. We have many northern species that trickle down the mountain to these unique habitats. How much time do I have you? Five to twelve. Five to twelve? Well, that's okay. We locked the doors. <laughs> uh, we have a captive audience here. So I'm going to keep going a little bit. Thanks, you. Um, or people can just eat, and I'll just keep talking. But you, you want a few minutes to talk also. So I'm going to roll through this faster here. You guys talk about James Bigford Nature Preserve briefly. No, Ralph covered it, so I'm not going to talk about it much. It's this Oh, there's the, the dormitory right here to give you reference. All of this side of the mountain is the James Bigford Nature Preserve that Ralph did the floor on, Ralph and, and Ben. 
and it is magnificent forest up there. It's approaching old growth, 100 years plus old now, it's been protected, and it's rich, rich, mixed mesophytic forest. Some of you I know have already walked the trails up in here, so you've got to experience some of this. I mentioned the cave beetle. The Ralph mentioned the uh, Chrysosplenium, the golden saxifrage, which is very, very rare in Kentucky, only known from a few places. And then common species like Jack in the Pulpit, but there's a species that Ralph did not collect, very rare Jack in the Pulpit that grows in the mountain here called Erisema baglia. <laughs> I'm going to actually find a new species because Ben Bagley used to be the naturalist and the environmental education director here. Susan is now that uh, person, so I'm going to switch this out with Susan, I think. Um, and it's not all forested. Lucy documented these really cool pine communities here. I've been focused on mixed mesophytic, but there's many other forest communities. Uh, Ralph mentioned the um, Appalachian oak communities, but there's these great pine communities filled with um, you walk underneath here, it's big blue stem and little blue stem. It's like being in a prairie out west almost. Very, very cool. I think that bell is telling me to shut up. But, um, <laughs> so open pine woodlands just adds to that great diversity of habitats, cool rock outcrops. I found this plant in the Pine Barrens, and I wasn't sure what it was because I didn't know a helium from Canadensi at the time. Keep it out, blah, blah. and then found out it was collected once in Kentucky, 100 years ago, almost exactly to the day from when I collected it, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, yellow wild indigo, baptisia, um, pale corydalis. This I just found this on the large rock outcrops that Hugh and I went to. Real cool plant. I'll stop after I finish Bland Forest, you. Um, but Bland Forest is near and dear to my heart. It's the largest tract of old growth forest in Kentucky. I found it when I was doing the inventory on the mountain here, and uh, I don't know, large, 2,300 acres of uncut forest. Now the chestnuts have died, there's been impacts that way, but otherwise, very, very little, there's no roads. And it's basically completely trailless. Um, I just list those things, blah, blah, blah. And great rock outcrops, we hike here. I don't know if the Footsteps of Lucy Braun program is going here or not this, this trip, yes? Good. Uh, very cool place. Everything, when you stand on this rock and you look, you're looking at exactly what the Native Americans saw when they sat on that rock. Old growth forest. The trees, all the trees that we've cored are between two to 300 and 330 years old. Some bigger ones that we haven't cored. So it's what I call original equipment. And I don't know if you guys know rhododendron maximum. It's a great rhododendron, but it makes dense, dense what we call roto hells and um, <laughs> impenetrable thickets. That we, we, we rate roto hells like you do whitewater streams, class one, two, three, four, five, six, and it really becomes fun. The class five and six roto hells, you either have to belly crawl on your belly all the way through, or you gotta become arboreal and climb up into the branches and get through the thing. Very fun, great rock outcrops, um, where we leave lots of hikes, and there's the layout. So, I'm going to let Hugh take over now and say a few words. Otherwise, I'll keep going. I could talk about Pine Mountain Woods for days. I wish I could go on the mountain with all of you and continue talking here. I've been and, in this uh, position before he's left me 60 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're not going to give away the food. It's OK. We're doing OK. So I'll let Hugh go, and I'll just keep up. I never even got to my bear stories. I got all kinds of cool bear stories. So, but Hugh's our boss, so I better turn it over to him right now. Go ahead, Hugh. It was Mark that said, let's do the whole mountain. And he was acting like a bunch of experts got together. He said, let's do the whole mountain. And I said, you're crazy. I was the chairman, not, not the staff director. And now I'm the chairman. It's yeah. reversed. <laughs> and he's got, Mark's been my muse. Every place he ever finds is the best place he's ever found. <laughs> Go buy this, and so it's been about a 35 year relationship. Yeah, and we still get along. <laughs> and uh, today we have a staff of five, and we're doing more work on all five state agencies that are supposed to be doing this. Um, I'd say uh, per acre. Last year we raised over six million dollars. That's about four times as much as any conservation organization has ever raised in a year in Kentucky. We unfortunately or fortunately have about ten million dollars worth of options in hand, but that's because we've been working on that for twenty years. Some of these are 
some of these projects take um, 20 years. Um, the, that largest tract on the mountain we just closed on 2,050 acres and 26 family members own stock in a family enterprise. So, you know, everybody doesn't always get along to kind of sit on the front porch, porch and, and work and work to do this. But it, and in terms of a kind of bang for your buck, if you're worried about biological diversity, we've been buying land for five, six, seven hundred an acre. And, and uh, recently there was a highway project up near Wood, and we blackmailed the Department of Transportation for about $80,000 in mitigation money and bought 50 acres, and it cost half a million dollars. It's 8000 So I like working down here. It's <laughs> you feel a lot more accomplishment for your efforts. Um, the continuation of that trail, I, when I worked for the Nature Conservancy, many of you have heard of Pat Noon and I'm sure he's part of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, the American Farmlands Trust, he was president of the Nature Conservancy for years. They had a seminar and Pat was going to go talk to the CEO of DuPont, so he couldn't do the seminar. He opened the door and said, ask, and shut it. That's, fundraising becomes a big part of the dialogue, but the other thing he said was biodiversity doesn't sell. So um, uh, to, to the average public, it's not just what were you showing that you said people be all care Rogers Cave. Yeah, the cave eel. We have two other caves we're trying to buy right now that haven't been species. So there's a whole lot of uh, exciting projects for people that do care about biodiversity. E.O. Wilson said the loss of species is the thing our grandchildren will least forgive us. And Neil Wilson's always been one of my gurus that I've grown up with. Um, and uh, between Mark and Neil Wilson, I'm the brokest lawyer you'll ever meet. Um, his 30 years of conservation work fighting the big guys that pay the big lawyers is not the way to make money, but I'm pretty happy. I've worked on over 200 natural area projects in the state in the last three years, and I've uh, probably lost 400 or we tried about. So it's an ongoing effort. Um, I think we're doing good work. Uh, I've ended several of my programs after doing a lot of the doom and gloom stuff like I started with, with I hope the cockroaches are smart enough not to reinvent corporations. <laughs> and, and so I'll end with that today. But certainly show you in on, on uh, anything we're doing. Uh, we've got about 10,000 acres in play right now. Thank <laughs> you.